Good morning everyone and welcome to this which is the third of our webinar series for 2015. I'm Tom Pritchard, your host for today's session. I'm going to be introducing you to our speaker shortly and also rounding up at the end. Today's webinar is entitled Introduction to Limit State Ring and it's going to provide you with an overview of the theory and application of our masonry arch analysis software, Limit State Ring. The main section of the webinar will run until approximately 10 a.m. UK time and we will include five to ten minutes at the end for questions. These can be posted at any time via the chat functionality that's present in the webinar interface in front of you. We do try to answer as many questions as we can, but sometimes this isn't always possible, so apologies in advance if we are unable to get to yours. We will, however, follow up on any unanswered questions after the webinar is finished. Uh, I know we have a mixed audience today. Some of you will have used the Limit State Ring before. Some of you will be quite new to it. If you do have some specific questions regarding the software, which may require quite a long or considered answer, please do contact us outside of the webinar via info at limitstate.com and we'll be more than happy to answer these in detail for you. So without further delay, our speaker today is Professor Matthew Gilbert, who is the Limit State Ring Product Manager, and I will now pass you over to him. Thanks very much, Tom, and thanks very much to, to all of you for joining this, uh, this webinar today. Just first of all, give you an indication of what we're going to uh, cover in the webinar. Um, we'll look initially at Masonry Arch Bridge basics, so fundamental modes of response of Masonry Arch Bridges, and then we'll move on to look at uh, how we can analyze such bridges using Limit State Ring. Um, finally, we'll uh, um, cover some examples and, uh, and some, some recent developments that, that have taken place with the software and wrap up with some conclusions. Before we get into the uh, the main body of the, the webinar, I'll just say a few words about Limit State for those of you not familiar with the company. It's actually the University of Sheffield spin out company, uh, focusing on commercializing academic research, providing engineers with powerful software, primarily for the ultimate Limit State uh, analysis um, of structures and uh, geotechnical constructions. And the key differentiator is we're taking a advantage of state-of-the-art algorithms and optimization technology which are not used in conventional tools and because we're a company we can make sure that the software is, is robust, well validated and uh, easy to use and obviously uh, well supported as well. So just to give you an indication of where Limit State products fit in, um, if we look at the, the landscape of engineering analysis tools. Typically we can divide those into, into two categories, so hand type calculations which may have been automated in simple spreadsheet or um, simple software program. Or at the other end of the spectrum, um, advanced tools which use, uh, for example, non-unifying elements. And there's quite a, a big divide, quite a big gap between those two types of tools. And what we're focusing on is actually bridging that gap or filling that gap with mainstream numerical uh, rigid plastic analysis tools. And the uh, particular uh, example we've got on screen at the moment is a geotechnical example, so slope or stability or um, retaining wall examples. Clearly of interest today is uh, masonry, arch bridge, uh, masonry arch bridges, so um, the same applies uh, to, to those structural forms as well. And uh, it also transfers to other uh, types of problems as well, so for example concrete slabs, uh, yield line analysis has remained a hand-based tool for many years. Um, on the other hand, you could use, for example, non-linear elements to analyze those types of uh, structures at the collapse state. On the other hand, um, you can bridge that gap with um, numerical uh, rigid plastic analysis. So that brings us nicely on to uh, the current products in the Limit State product range. So we have Limit State Ring, which is clearly the focus of today's um, webinar. We've also got a geotechnical product, Limit State Geo, and a new product um, is Limit State Slab which can be used, for example, to demonstrate that an existing uh, concrete bridge deck has more capacity uh, than conventional methods, for example, elastic analysis methods would, would suggest. Uh, 
And those of you who are interested in, in, in this, then there's actually a, a webinar covering the assessment of concrete bridge decks using Limit State Slab uh, in a few weeks' time. And I think you can uh, register for that uh, today via the LimitState.com website. Okay. Um, in terms of um, the main um, products that have been around for the last few years, so, so Limit State Slab is a, is, a, is a new product, only launched uh, earlier in 2015, but Limit State Ring, Limit State Geo are now widely used in many countries, I think more than 30 countries worldwide, and by many large companies um, um, in the UK and abroad. And we've just got a, a client list on the website, so I've got a screenshot of, um, of A, of that um, A to Z list of um, selected clients, and uh, you can see it's many big names, so Acom, Amy, Arab, Atkins, and so forth. Okay, so now move on to um, look at uh, basics of masonry arch uh, bridges. Um, observations we can make, there are a large number of spans. Um, most are more than 100 years old and because they are in service very often they need to be um, regularly assessed and they come in, come in many different shapes and sizes um, single multi-span um, and uh, the actual shape of the arch barrel uh, again is, 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 is um, very uh, varied in, 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 in terms of shape in terms of um, what makes up a masonry arch bridge number of elements and there's some quite uh, um, archaic terminology which can confuse the newcomer so um, typically we talk about the underside of the the arch being the intrados the external um, surface of the arch barrel being the extrados and um, above the the arch itself we have potentially backing backfill providing then a level road or rail service. Supporting or, or containing the soil, we have spandrel walls, um, and the arch typically will, um, will spring from um, what are called skewbacks, if we, if we have a semicircular uh, arch form sitting on abutments. So there are many different um, 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 terms that you really do need to come accustomed to, um, with um, when you um, um, get into this field if, if you haven't already. Um, in terms of actually how masonry arch, arches stand, then some quite um, pioneering work was done in the, in the 17th century by, uh, by Hook, who showed that um, if you take all the voussoirs that you're going to use to construct your masonry arch, you hang them from a weightless chain, you look at the shape that that chain takes up, you then invert it, then providing that profile, that shape fits entirely within the masonry, then your arch will stand. So that's quite a, quite a pivotal uh, moment in the, uh, in the in the life of the uh, um, the, the, the masonry uh, arch engineer, if you like, and this this profile um, we now typically term the line of thrust. It's a sort of line of uh, centre of compression. Of course, there are many potential lines of thrust because we're dealing with a statically indeterminate structure. And this was was nicely shown by. Um, um, William Barlow in the um, in the um, early part of the 19th century, I guess, um, who showed that um, providing um, you can well, he actually constructed a, an arch with six voussoirs, and each between each voussoir there were four timber blocks, and he showed that you could move, remove all but one of those blocks and still demonstrate that the, the arch could stand. So, for example, you could remove all the timber blocks other than the ones I've just shared in red, and the arch will stand. And so this is a nice uh, 
practical demonstration of the multiplicity of lines of thrust in a masonry arch bridge. However, if you apply a disturbing force to the structure, then there becomes a point where you can apply no more load. And you have a limiting line of thrust. If you try to apply any more load, then hinges will form and you will um, get to the collapse state. And um, here we've got a, an example of a, um, not actually a bridge, but a, a freestanding arch, which is close to collapse. And to avoid the, the, the structure from collapsing completely, then um, a wall has been uh, placed um, beneath the arch. Um, so clearly, um, in a masonry arch bridge, we want to avoid um, this scenario from happening. Now, as engineers, we um, go to our bridges and we, we make various observations and, and take various measurements. And one of the things to say is that hooks finding tells us that shape is very important. So when you go to your bridge, making sure that you get a good representation of the arch shape um, is very important because it's the pattern of loading in relation to the shape of the arch which governs stability. So this example shown on screen um, is some, an example I came across a number of years ago. The um, diagram on the left provides a, a reasonable representation of the, the shape of the arch in the field. However, the um, representation on the right was actually um, the model of, of the, the bridge on the left, which clearly doesn't represent it particularly well. The conclusion from the modeling that, was, um, that took place was that this bridge could carry no live load at all. So if you misrepresent the shape of the arch, then the findings that you get from your analysis are likely to be um, very misleading, to say the least. So what I would say is that getting the shape of the arch right is as important as, for example, measuring the overall depth of a steel beam, as an example. Now, we focused on the on the arch, the masonry arch in isolation. Clearly a masonry arch bridge is a lot more than a masonry arch in isolation because we have backfill which is provided to provide the normally level traffic surface. And we also have a three dimensional aspect because we have, for example, spandrel walls um, typically at, at the edges of the bridge but possibly internally as well. And it's the, the overall system behavior, which is, is what we're trying to capture when we're doing an analysis of a bridge. In limit state ring, we're primarily focusing on a two-dimensional idealization of the structure. So we're looking at the, the soil arch interaction and modeling that as, as, as faithfully as we can, given the inputs that we have at our disposal. And so in terms of how the arch interacts with the fill. When we have sway of the, the arch, then we have pressures mobilized that act to restrain movement of the barrel. When we apply a live load, we have um, dispersion of that live load through the, the fill material. So there are two aspects which are important to, to capture in our assessment. What we're often dealing with as well are defects. So those defects could be um, integral to the, um, the form that was used to, um, form of construction that was used when constructing the bridge. So for example, uh, ring separation is always going to be a potential issue 
if we're dealing with a multi-ring brickwork arch bridge of any decent span because the the mortar joint between the arch rings is unlikely to have the strength required to um, allow us to act as one. So what we will typically get then is a mode of response where we have hinges forming in individual rings. We also have um, um, very often in, in bridges of any significant span um, separation of the of the attachment of the spandrel walls at the edges of the bridge and the, the main um, barrel. Typically we have a, a mismatch in stiffness between the the stiffness of the soil that's in the center portion and the the much stiffer spandrel walls that exist at the edge. And then the, the third defect I've got here, it's, it's, it's a small subset of the defects you could come across, um, but the third one is quite an extreme case of um, mining subsidence. So if we have um, movement of um, one of the supports, we can have quite heavy distortion of the arch shape. And clearly, um, as we now know, arch shape is pretty important when it comes to the stability of the structure. So in terms of uh, how we go about um, analyzing um, these structures, a number of options. Um, what we're going to be focusing on today is um, limit state ring, which carries out a limit analysis. It's effectively a mechanism method where we're assuming that the blocks are rigid. Um, so in terms of complexity, it's more complex than the very simple um, semi-empirical MEXI method as an example, but it's uh, much simpler than, for example, nonlinear finite elements or discrete elements. What we've tried to do with ring is, in a sense, invade the territory of the, um, the simple methods by making it very easy quick and easy to, to do a, a simple assessment using default parameters. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've also made it possible to, um, for example, specify local properties um, of the, you know, the kind that we uh, typically associate with um, more sophisticated, for example, non-linear finite element um, analysis. So we're trying to um, provide a, a very um, general purpose tool in the middle ground of this uh, um, um, range of tools. Okay, so um, presentation is going to move on to um, how the software actually works. What I'm actually going to do though is um, actually just uh, start to use the software uh, and then we'll come back to the, the slides a little bit later. So when you uh, start the software, you um, see uh, what's called a new bridge wizard, um, which guides you through the process of setting up a bridge model. So the very first uh, dialog uh, allows you to specify um, various details of the structure, where it is, any comments, and also some quite fundamental um, items, such as whether we're dealing with a, a highway bridge or an underlying railway bridge. So to start with, we'll, um, we'll, we'll just use the default. So let's assume we've got a highway bridge. And that brings us then on to um, the start of a number of, um, of tabs, which allow us to specify the geometry. The first thing we can do is we can specify whether or not we've got an end standing pier um, at the end of the bridge. If we haven't, then it's assumed that the, the, end, the end abutments are rigid. And that leaves us then to um, define details of the, the spans in our, our structure. And what we can do is specify details of how the, the arch barrel of span one is constructed. Is it uh, a stone voussoir arch or is it um, some kind of brickwork um, arch? And also, 
we can specify various details of the shape of the, the structure. Now normally if you've done a, um, a survey of the bridge we will be able to um, use the user-defined shape. If we haven't yet done um, a detailed survey and um, the, the shape is clearly segmental or free centered as, as an example, then we could uh, um, um, simply enter a reduced number of parameters. So in the case of a segmental shape, all we need to enter is the span and the rise. And um, if it's a voussoir arch, then we only have details of one ring to specify. So thickness and number of units. And also I can now specify whether this is a single span bridge or whether there's going to be more spans um, to come after this bridge. So as an example, uh, let's uh, say we've got a two span bridge to analyze. And if we've got two, more than one span, then the next uh, tab is going to be details of the pier. So we can specify, for example, the height of the pier. Let's say it's 2,500 millimeters. Uh, we can specify the height at the top and the bottom, and uh, we can also specify, as we could actually um, at the the ends of the bridge, whether there's any backing over the uh, the pier. So we can specify whether there's backing over piers and also over abutments. Um, moving on then to the second span, by default. The span details will be exactly the same as for the previous span. Um, so um, the assumption being that we have a series of identical spans. Um, let's uh, let's keep keep the same geometry. And if I then move on to next, we move on to the right abutment. And as you can see, you can specify uh, backing over that abutment. And then the final tab in the geometry area of the wizard is the fill profile. So we can enter as many pro profile points as we want. And we can also differentiate between um, the uppermost uh, points of the road surface in the case of a highway bridge. And also um, we, can, we can specify the depth of the, um, for example, the, the, sub, the road base, sub base tarmac and provide different properties to that compared with the underlying film material. So if we move on, the, the next area of the wizard um, focuses on partial factors. So if you are assessing a bridge using um, an assessment code, then you will have values for partial factors for, um, for example, axle load, dynamic factor, and so forth. Just for some for simplicity in this this webinar, I'm just going to uh, assume that we have unit values here. And instead, move straight on to the materials area of the the wizard, where I can specify either global masonry properties for the whole bridge, or if, for example, I have um, a bridge which has, for example, stone piers but brickwork um, arch barrels, then I can specify different properties for those in this area of the wizard. Here I'm going to just assume that we've got uh, the same properties throughout. And in terms of the, the actual properties that we're, we're asked to specify, uh, it's the unit weight, it's the compressive strength of the masonry, and also a specification of whether um, we should model sliding failure, and if so, what the coefficient of friction is between voussoirs. And what I'm going to do is keep the default properties, which are reasonable in the absence of other information. And that brings me on to um, the backfill definition. So we have the standard geotechnical parameters for backfill, unit weight, angle of friction, and cohesion. And uh, we've just got uh, a couple of options at the right-hand side uh, asking whether or not we should model dispersion of the live load through the fill. 
and whether we should model passive pressures. So those are the two uh, effects of the soil which I highlighted uh, earlier on in the presentation. And if we want to have a slightly more in-depth um, look at um, how the effects of the soil are modelled, then there's an advanced tab which allows us to um, go into all the gory details. Um, what I would suggest if you do want to um, um, change those advanced properties that you do do that in consultation with the uh, the manual that comes in the software. And then finally in the materials area um, we are able to um, edit um, properties of the surface fill as distinct from the main backfill. So there's two things we can do. We can change the unit weight and also we can change the dispersion of the live load through that surface fill. And then finally in the in the wizard we move on to the, the loads area or load case area. Um, by default we've got a, a one kilonewton single axle but if I click the vehicle database then you can see that we've got uh, a series of vehicles built into the software which we can uh, use for the bridge in, in question. So for example, um, I might want to choose uh, an EU, uh, European Union double axle loading uh, where we've got two axles at uh, one meter centers. To do that I will click import and um, then I can um, apply that to to my bridge. And if I click finish, then I end up uh, um, seeing a view of the bridge that I've defined with the, the load. And if I click the green um, play button at the, uh, the, the, at the top, in the top um, toolbar area of the software, then straight away I can carry out an analysis of this, this, this bridge. And what you can see very clearly is that um, the mode of response or the critical failure mechanism has been identified and uh, we can see that involves seven hinges. We've got both spans being involved in the, the failure mechanism and we've also got a thrust line shown in blue um, showing how the uh, the load is being carried by the masonry. And in the, the output area, we actually can see some more information. We can see that there's something called an adequacy factor of 3.35. Now the adequacy factor is the multiplier on the live loading that we specified. So it's saying that we can increase that by 3.35 times before we got we get collapse. Now I haven't changed the position of the um, the vehicle so I don't actually know that this is the critical position um, so what I might want to do is actually just um, um, move this around. There's actually an option here which I, I will specify which is um, solve automatically after um, dragging the vehicle and we can see that if I if I do that, then um, I get various different values of the adequacy factor depending on where the the load is. And the critical position appears to be uh, at about 1,600 millimeters from the left-hand span, and the adequacy factor is 3.17. Now what I've done here is, is use the software in sort of interactive mode where I've actually um, manually moved the vehicle around. Another option is to um, actually apply um, the vehicle at a series, series of regularly spaced points along the length of the bridge. Um, so to do that, I would um, add load cases. So I could, for example, add, add 200, sorry, 20 load cases 
at, for example, 200 millimeter increments. And if I click solve, then um, I um, can instantly um, undertake um, a series of, um, uh, of analyses. And um, actually, the, the increments that I specify mean that I couldn't quite get to the 3.16, but these, the, the critical location uh, gives me um, 3.17 as the adequacy factor. Um, so that's um, a kind of a, a whirlwind um, tour of, um, of using the software in, in, in one mode using the wizard with, with many default parameters um, um, specified by the software. What I'll do now is I'll go back to the um, presentation and just explain to you how the software is actually providing the results that we see before us. Um, okay, so first of all, just a a few words about what's different about this software compared with other um, masonry arch bridge analysis software. Um, the first thing is it's using a, a rigorous mathematical formulation which isn't used in other commercial software. We've, we've got a strong focus on validating the software against test results and what we've seen is that the the user interface allows us to rapidly estimate the capacity of the bridge. So that's, that's mode 3A, if you like. Um, what I haven't done, and what I will do a little bit later, is explain how you can provide, how you can perform a slightly more detailed analysis by varying local properties and the like. Um, just a few words on, on what other people say. There's, a, there's actually a, a, a guide um, developed by the industry in the UK in the, in the 2000s, which um, um, says a few words about the rigid block method used by uh, limit state rain. Um, it, it, it suggests it's a, a significant improvement from basic limit analysis formulations, and uh, it's a versatile tool. So anyway. How does it actually work? Well, when you apply uh, a load on the bridge, then the first thing that happens is that live load is dispersed through the fill. And by default, the load is assumed to be dispersed using a truncated Boussin-esque um, model, as uh, shown on the screen now. So that lands then onto masonry blocks. And those masonry blocks are separated by contacts. And in limit state ring, that's really where the interesting uh, things happen. So that's where crushing, sliding, hinging, that's where those modes of response are actually modeled. And in addition to dispersal of the live load, we also um, introduce one-dimensional um, elements that we call backfill elements, which represent the, the passive resistance provided by the surrounding backfill. And those elements effectively uh, respond by applying passive pressures when the, the arch moves into them, and they um, do not apply any any pressures when the the arch moves away from them. So effectively, they they work in one direction only. In terms of the visual objects that um, the user sees on screen, it's summed up on on on, on this uh, slide, the, the main other other elements are that I haven't mentioned are the hinges and the the thrust line, uh, which uh, effectively uh, um, moves between the or, or, or goes between the hinges. Um, the backfill elements are shown in blue when they're, they're active, um, and and in grey when they're not. And um, 
I think that probably um, sums up the main um, features of the of, of the software that you can see on screen. So the big question is how does the software actually find a solution? Well, what I'm going to do is going to go back to some of the previous slides that I that I showed. Um, what we know is that um, there are many possible lines of thrust that can carry um, deployed load in the case of a masonry arch bridge. Um, another way of thinking about a line of thrust is a permissible equilibrium state. So of all the permissible equilibrium states, we can use optimization to find the one that corresponds to the maximum load factor or adequacy factor as we term um, that in limit state ring. And once we've found the, the maximum load factor, we know that, that um, as well as providing a thrust line which fits entirely within the masonry, it also corresponds with a point at which we get a, um, um, a hinged failure mechanism. In terms of the mathematics, what we're doing then is maximizing the load factor subject to equilibrium constraints. So in terms of each block within the, the masonry structure, what we're looking at is equilibrium in the, the x direction, the y direction, and the rotational sense. Each block has actions applied to it at the contacts. Those actions are shear force, normal force, and bending moment. And we also need to control the magnitudes of those parameters using the yield constraints. So the yield constraints basically um, state that the, the shear force has to be within limits, so it's got to be um, less than, in terms of magnitude, the normal force times the coefficient of friction. To make sure that the, the thrust line lies entirely within the masonry, in, in this case assuming um, infinite um, compressive strength, then um, the moment has got to be um, less than half the normal force times the, the thickness. So quite simple linear expressions which gives rise to a linear optimization problem which is very easy to solve on a desktop computer. And effectively we get the exact solution according to the theorems of plastic analysis for a given discretization of blocks. So that's the, the theory. How about um, validation against um, experimental results? Well, the software was actually developed in the early 1990s originally in parallel with a series of, of large-scale tests that were being carried out at that time. So we've got a, an image of uh, a, a bridge being set up ready for test uh, shown on the slide. And um, that series of tests cons comprised both single-span bridge tests and also multi-span bridge tests. And uh, the table that appears on screen now gives an indication of how well the results from the software agree with the um, experimental results that we saw in practice. So. Bridge 3.1 was a 3 meter span bridge. Um, the predicted capacity of 4.42 kilonewtons is 80% of the experimental capacity. So gives, providing a generally conservative assumption, uh, sorry, estimation of the capacity of the structure. There is an exception here, Bridge 5.1. We actually slightly overestimate the capacity. And the reason for that is this particular bridge was actually constructed um, using um, four brick arch rings. And in practice, we had an abrupt 
um, onset of ring separation at 1720 kilonewtons. Had that not occurred, had we been with a Vusvar arch, then um, the likelihood is that we would have uh, exceeded um, the capacity um, predicted by ring of 1915. And uh, certainly um, um, the comparable bridge which had inbuilt ring separation, so in other words, we had um, an equivalent bridge where all four rings were debonded from the outset, then we end up with, a, again, a conservative estimate of the capacity. And then finally, for um, the multi-span bridge um, with detached um, spandrel walls, then we end up with a very good um, prediction of, of capacity. Um, more recently, in the 2000s and up until um, the present day, we've been constructing um, bridges at the University of Salford. And the benefit of these bridges is we don't have some of the, the features of a real masonry arch bridge, which um, um, makes correlation with numerical models a little bit more taxing. So we don't have the, the spandrel walls at the edges of the bridge. We simply have a um, an arch and surrounding soil in effectively a large fish tank so we can see exactly what's going on and so we can um, um, remove the effects of the spandrel walls. And in the case of the first two bridges that were, were carried out in this series, then you can see the right-hand column, we got very close prediction of the, um, the low carrying capacity of the bridges. And um, the next slide shows uh, a view of one of the Salford arches being tested. I'm not sure what you can see, but we actually have digital imaging techniques which allow us to um, actually plot the um, the movement of soil particles so we can get a very good understanding of how the the arch and soil interact and these tests are allowing ongoing validation and improvement of the software and um, in addition to those uh, tests carried out at Salford there's a series of tests being carried out at the University of Sheffield um, some small scale tests um, were published in the Proceedings Institution of Civil Engineers a couple of years ago. Um, quite interesting because we were able to isolate the different effects of the soil. So we were able to, for example, um, um, load one side of the bridge directly onto the arch but still have um, passive restraints on the right hand side. We actually did a number of permutations where we could remove or add load spreading, passive resistance and the like. And we found that the predicted capacity was always within 10%, which we were um, very, uh, very pleased with, basically indicating that the software is properly identifying the different um, um, facets of soil switch inter interaction. Okay, if we move on to look at um, application of the bridge, um, what I've demonstrated already using the software is how we can use the wizard to quickly um, get an impression of the likely load carrying capacity of the structure. Clearly, if using default parameters, we identify very large reserves of strength and that might mean that we don't need to spend a lot of time and effort on, uh, on getting a more refined analysis. On the other hand, um, if the opposite is true, then we may want to move to um, a detailed assessment and with a detailed assessment we might, for example, want to um, specify all the, the relevant details that we have in our bridge, so for example, uh, local properties um, of, um, for example, um, 
the masonry in the vicinity of the abutments in this case. So for example, um, if this, this small bridge was, was crossing a stream, it's very often uh, the case that you have more to wash out in the vicinity of the abutments and we can, using the software, actually specify those directly. And what I'll do is I'll go back now to the software. So if I um, just remove um, all load cases, and so we just got one load that we're dealing with. So this is the critical one that we found where the additive factor is 3.7. And let's suppose now that, for example, this bridge pier was sitting in a stream or a river and that we had more to wash out. Now, a number of options. One option is to simply take action and repoint. But before that's possible, you may want to see what the effects of that, uh, that mortal loss are. So to do that, what we can do is we can specify um, where that, that mortar loss is. So if I specify something or select something in the software, then the properties appear in the property editor to the right hand side. And if I home in on the contacts, then I can now specify, for example, that the, there is 100 millimeters of mortar loss at one side and you can see if I zoom in I may have mortar loss on both sides so in which case I could specify mortar loss at both sides of the, um, the pier and if I now click solve then I can see two things First thing I can see on screen is that the the line of thrust now can't any longer reach the extremity of the the face of the pier because of the mortar loss, and also I can see the effect of that on the adequacy factor. It's gone down from 3.17 to 2.887, so a measurable reduction in the adequacy factor. Um, following the specification of that, that mortar loss. And there are a number of um, similar um, operations that I could perform. So for example, I could also specify uh, different properties, for example, for the masonry. So for example, I could specify that the, um, um, the masonry strength was different in certain areas. For example, if, if a bridge has had patch repairs, it may be that we've got uh, stronger or weaker bridges in different areas of the structure. And using all features of the, um, the bridge, you're likely to get a, a much better representation of the, the carrying capacity. Um, and um, just uh, just to say that um, whatever analysis that you perform, then all the details that you've specified and also the critical murder response um, are shown in a in the report, which you can um, obviously print out, save as a PDF, etc., and and pass to your client. So, a couple of examples. Um, it's a short webinar today, um, so I haven't had time to go into um, some of the detailed areas. So, for example, multi-ring arches. It is possible to um, specify those using the software, so we can get the the murder response that we see in the lab. It's also possible to model railway loading. Um, with railway loading then it's assumed that um, we have distribution through adjacent sleepers in line with um, typical assessment codes. 
um, I've got a, a, um, an issue on the on the slide there. Um, it's supposed to be just a, a multi-span structure. Um, if I go back to the software, I actually got this particular bridge. It's quite an interesting bridge because it has um, quite stocky peers, and some assessment codes will tell you that if you've got stocky peers, you can treat the, the bridge as a series of single spans. However, there's also backing above the abutments, above the peers. So if we actually do an analysis of this structure, then we see that actually a multi-span murder response is critical. Okay, so what I would advise you to do is to model as many features of the of the structure as you as you can. Just very very quickly before we take questions, just say a few things about recent developments. The current version of the software is Limit State Ring 3.1, uh, released last summer. Um, you can see this the software uh, has been in, in, in development for for more than two decades, so it's a very well established piece of software. Um, in version 3, which released two or three years ago, we added quite a number of features, um, enhancements to the user interface, the ability to model reinforcement of the masonry, ability to, to model um, arch profiles more flexibly, etc. But in 3.1, just want to uh, point out a, a, a number of uh, features which uh, we've, we've added. Um, it's really all about speed up and being able to handle larger models. So we had one of our clients was routinely modeling multi-span viaducts with presumed ring separation with railway loading vehicles with many, many axles. So what they were finding was there was a limit to the size of problem that they could solve. So what we've did, done in 3.1 is we've increased by a factor of four the size of problem that you can solve, and we've also made available a 64-bit version so that even larger problems can be solved. And then finally, um, multiple low case problems um, can be solved much more quickly than before. So just to, to wrap up, um, software is a rapid, but hopefully, uh, as you can see, a powerful analysis tool for masonry arch bridges. It automatically identifies modes of failure, um, whether that be a multi-span, or multi-ring arch structure. It's been validated over an extended period of time, and uh, it can be used in two, two ways. One, um, for a quick assessment using default parameters, or secondly, for an in-depth assessment using a detailed knowledge of the bridge, geometry, local properties, and, and so forth. Okay, so that finishes the um, the, soft, the, the main um, webinar. I've got a number of um, of questions. Um, first question is: Can ring model skew arches? Um, the answer is: It's um, a two-dimensional software program, so it doesn't model a skew arch directly. However, um, Codes of practice provide advice, and certainly you can model bridges with um, moderate degree of skew um, without difficulty. Um, can a missing brick block be modeled? Um, the answer is um, yes, it can. Um, what you can do is you can, for example, model that with, with mortar loss if you've, if you've got a, a voussoir. Um, representation of the, of the bridge, so you could have, for example, uh, a third of the um, the arch barrel thickness missing. Can ring be used to model arch strengthening, e.g. replace fill with firm concrete, inserting bars, etc. So you can model um, 
the benefits that you get from um, different fill materials by effectively um, increasing, enhancing the, the properties. So instead of the default properties of fires 30 degrees, you can um, have a much uh, higher angle of friction. In terms of um, inserting bars, using the reinforcement facility, you can actually um, represent um, reinforcement in the arch barrel. However, word of warning, the assumption is that you have a, a ductile mode of response, so um, you need to be uh, um, a little bit careful when introducing um, reinforcement in your masonry arch. Um, another question come in, um, can we model a saddle over a brick arch in ring? Um, actually you can. Um, what you can do is you can model a saddle as an additional ring and you can um, add reinforcement to that additional ring to represent the reinforcement in the saddle. So it um, requires a little bit of care but it is possible um, to do that. Um, another question is there any comparison available between MEXI methods and limit state ring? If we model an ideal arch satisfying all requirements of the MEXI method. Um, there are various, um, have been various studies that have been carried out um, that have compared the MEXI method against not just limit state ring but also other methods. Most recently, there was a paper in the Proceedings of the ICE uh, a year or two ago, which, which did that. Um, the MEXI method, um, if you look at the fundamental formulation, it doesn't deal with, um, for example, short span bridges particularly well. It misses out some key features of short span bridges. Um, so it can be um, non-conservative. For those cases, um, there are many, many um, disadvantages of the MEXI method, and I think increasingly um, engineers are moving away from from that 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 technique. So I'm involved, for example, in um, um, re revising the, the the UIC masonry arch code, and we're talking about whether the MEXI method will will appear at all in the next edition. But if it does, then it's, it's likely to be um, um, there for completeness rather than as a tool that we'd, we, we would recommend people use. Um, how, are, how are mortar compressive strength modelled as only the compressive strength of the blocks are modelled are entered? That's not actually the case. The, the, the masonry strength that you enter is a composite value, so you're looking to enter um, a value which reflects the combination of unit strength and mortar strength. Um, what is the comparison between ring and archie? So archie is another um, um, masonry arch tool which has been around for a number of years. In general, um, ring has um, a number of benefits. For example, for multi-span bridges with Archer, you need to manually balance thrusts at the pier head in order to um, get to a solution, whereas with Ring, we get there directly. In terms of the soil model that we're using, we believe that the, the model used in Ring has been informed by experiments in a way that perhaps the soil model in Archer hasn't. So, Generally speaking, we can um, re slightly reduce the amount of conservatism in an assessment by having a more realistic uh, representation of how the soil is modelled. Um, but we can send uh, the person who uh, made that uh, answer, asked that question a bit more detail about that after the webinar. And um, I think we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to 
hand back over to, to Tom Pritchard to, to wrap up and we will answer any uh, questions that we didn't have time to answer um, by email after the, uh, after the webinar. Thanks Matthew and thanks everyone for listening. Uh, we're now near to the end of the webinar. We hope you found that informative. Um, for people who are current users of the software, we hope that you learned something a bit new about the software. Maybe you didn't already know. Uh, if the webinar has prompted any questions, like Matthew said, please do get in touch via telephone or by emailing us on info at limitstate.com and we'll be very happy to help. Uh, for people who aren't current users of the software, we will be in touch over the next few days just to get some feedback uh, to find out whether you have any further questions following the webinar and also to see whether you think Limit State Ring might be useful software for you. Um, everyone here may also be interested to know that we have a, a number of forthcoming webinars covering all the Limit State product range, so including Limit State Ring as well as Limit State Geo and Limit State Slab. Uh, some of which will focus more on particular problem types and applications of the software. Uh, so please look out for the event notifications that will be sent out via email, and they are also posted on our website at www.limitstate.com forward slash webinars. So again, thank you all for taking the time to join us today, and we hope to see you all again for one of our future sessions. Goodbye.